Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Afkar Aslam of Yieldworks. Going to talk today about commonality and correlation analysis. Afkar, what is commonality and correlation analysis? So commonality and correlation analysis, Ed, is the ability to take a low-yielding wafers or abnormally high-yielding wafers and determine what causes that spike, right? It could be a dip in yield, it could be an increase in yield, uh, and being able to look at internally the data and saying, hey, um, the reason why we have a better yield or low yield is because we made a, a process change or we improved our test program. But a lot of the times the actual problem doesn't lie within test program efficiency or improvements. It lies you know, in where process change was made or maybe design change was made. There's attributing you know, the low yield. Of course, everybody loves high yield, right? But it's something that, you know, in the industry, we have to be cautious about as well. Say, you know, why didn't my yield abnormally increase when I didn't touch my process, I didn't touch my design. So why am I seeing a yield improvement? But nine out of 10 times, engineers are always focused on, hey, I have a low yielding log, but I have a low yielding wafer. And I continue to see this trend. And I'm trying to figure out, hey, what is causing that low yield, okay? So let's take a closer look. Sure. Aftcar, what are we looking at? Okay, so what we're looking at over here is this the really three main elements of data that are collected or generated during the actual life cycle of a chip. Okay, uh, over here, you'll see that we have the you know, design data. This is, of course, uh, your IP that you select, you, you generate uh, with the different EDA tools, all the simulation, validation, verification that you do. And then we hand that over to manufacturing. So manufacturing, there's manufacturing data, process data, recipe data, and the likes. And then eventually we get into the world of yield management, right? Over here, uh, you know, there's different types of equipment that generate tests and some of the uh, data. And then from there, we look at yield. So over here, you can see I have a trend chart. Let's assume this is a you know, yield by wafer or yield by lot for a specific device. And I have this bad lots over here. Hey, you know, my target yield is something like this. And I have a series of lots that basically are low yielding. The first thing I'll basically do is say, hey, let me look within my world, right? So this is my world over here. And I can look at, hey, is there something wrong with my test program? Is there something wrong with my actual test equipment? Right? Uh, was there a wrong setup on the actual tester? You know, blah, blah, blah. I come up with a conclusion like to say, hey, you know what? The, the good lots that also ran, uh, ran on the same test equipment, they ran on the same test program version. Nothing changed. So we have an anomaly now as to what's causing that low yielding lots and low yielding wafers. At this point, as where I start to look over my shoulder, right, up to my nearest neighbor and say, hey, maybe the problem is with process. Now, um, with fabless companies, this is a big deal because, you know, fabless companies don't have their own fabs. So they don't have a whole bunch of access to process data. They typically get what PCM data. In some cases, if you're strong on the actual boundaries, they may give you some process data. But, you know, let's assume that you had access to process data. What you then go up and look at is say, you know, hey, was there something in the process that changed that basically, you know, attributed to those low yielding lots of wafers, right? So again, it can be time-based, right? So let's say and this is January and then this problem started in February, right? I will now look at to say, hey, in my process data over here, what changed? Did those lots go through a different equipment? Did those lots use a different recipe? Right. For example, did those lots of wafers use a different chamber and a furnace, for example? So there's a lot of variables over here, Ed, that we can look at, right? So equipment could be one, a recipe could be another one, chamber could be another one, equipment setup could be another one, right? Even as far as going down to like, you know, who is the operator? right, that, that ran that material would be data that we would look at. So then what we do is we say, hey, for those good lots versus those bad lots over here, with all this equipment process recipe data, uh, you know, what is the item that sticks out that potentially, you know, is a root cause for low yield? And on process equipment data, we could be collecting, you know, CD measurements, we could be collecting, you know, thickness and, you know, edge rates, right, which furnace it went into, which lot of a furnace that wafer was processed in. So there's a ton of data. Right, there's millions and millions of data points over here. You know, your typical chip 
It goes through, let's say, 80 or 90 process steps. On top of that, there's inspection steps, right? Um, there's a ton of data. And traditionally, it was very, very difficult to be able to go up and analyze that data. And number one, it was siloed, right? Um, in some cases, it's still siloed, right? But now with the element of AI and ML, we can build models that basically are able to cross-analyze test data with process data and say, hey, yeah, we think with a very strong degree of confidence that there was an equipment change that was made. And, you know, maybe the equipment went through a maintenance cycle and did not come up properly, which is what caused those low yielding uh, lots of wafers um, that we basically got over here. Does this get more complicated as you get into the multi-die type of configurations? Because you're no longer just testing a single die, it's not just one chiplet, it's all the chiplets put together and how they're functioning, right? So yes, it does get more complicated because right now, then what you're talking about, Ed, is you have the concept of wafer with chiplets on it. You have the concept of the two wafers are bonded together, right, which is also becoming more common now. Right. And from there, you know, you basically take a die from a wafer and then you put them into a package form. So you could have a low yielding wafer that's already got chiplets on it. It's already got, you know, bonded wafers. That's one uh, problem area. The other one would be, OK, you know, you have a multi uh, stack uh, package and then this package failed over here. Or, hey, all the die or all the die that are going to be packaged and assembly lot have a low yield. Right. And then again, you want to go back and do that root cause now. In this case, the root cause would not be just looking at process data for device A. He would be looking across, hey, what's my data for device B? What's my data for device C? And which of these combinations over here, right, cause that low yield? Or was it, hey, the problem is only with device A, device B and device C, but good. So you've got all this data, but what about the design data? How does that fit in here? Because you have a lot of design data as well, and a lot of that's very customized too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's assume that Hey, yeah, it wasn't a process issue. It was a process issue, but it wasn't really a manufacturing process issue. It was really a bad design or, hey, design parameters were being violated, right? My uh, DRC checks, for example. So then what we can go back and look at is, hey, what were my design specs, right? So typically, you know, you have a product design. Uh, in the product design, I have basically specifications. These specifications carry, you know, limits, right, on my design parameters, right? So then what I want to do is, hey, when I'm testing over here, I want to be able to look at, hey, what my test results within the spec. So I have, you know, T1, T2, T3. This is all related to design for test. So what I want to be able to do now is compare my actual results from ATE to the actual specs that were uh, defined at the time of design and saying, hey, do they correlate? And if they don't correlate, or well, they're way off, hey, there was nothing wrong in the process, there was nothing wrong in assembly and test because we wrote the test program per the specs, but the actual results are coming back really, really weird. Let's go back to the actual design and say, hey, did you guys mean to have those specs? That's what you guys need for simulation purposes. And if the answer is wrong, or it, it kind of like hints that, hey, it may be a design issue, that's how we hook back into design. Now, the other thing Ed, of importance here is, okay, hey, you may have a, a certain IP block, right, that is being um, used in a different device, and it's yielding 100%, right? But that, that same IP block is also used in these bad blocks over here. And then you say, hey, well, hey, same IP block, same test. Those tests are contributing to my low yield because they're failing what gives, right? And that's the connection now between ATE data and design data. And this gets more complicated as we get into some of these advanced designs, too, because you're thinking about design for tests. This really needs to be figured out all the way at the front end on the architecture side. You don't necessarily know all the things that are going to happen along the way. So design for tests from is basically what are we going to test? When are we going to test it? And where are we going to insert that testing, right? So let me show you. This slide over here gives a little bit more color. Right, so here is what we are talking about design. So in design, we have you know EDA tools. EDA tools themselves may introduce bugs in your design. You have IP libraries that you can basically build yourself or you procure, right? And then eventually you end up with a tape out that you end up to manufacturing. What will be the solutions of the future would be able to say, you know, hey, for this IP library that I'm selecting or this tape out that I have, which are the IP cells and IP blocks that are basically being are included in that tape out? 
Uh, by the way, have those been used in manufacturing a device already? So I, I can access process data. I can access uh, you know assembly and test data. I can access prototype data, whatever data that's available. They would be then able to use that data and say, you know what? I feel very confident using this IP library because it's actually running in other volume products. They are yielding high. I can actually look at the test results which is why I feel confident in using that IP block or that IP library. A very key point, because this is very rarely done in companies, and just because you know, those companies have been unable to join all of the silos of data. And so because this has already been shown to yield, does it necessarily match with what's coming out in the future? Because you have a lot of new elements that come into these designs as well. Some of them which are, okay, good die, bad neighborhood, right? Yeah. Um, so typically what we will do there is predict, right? We can we can use data that's being collected for existing devices. We can use data that's being collected for, you know, products that are being tested using that IP or IP block. And then from there, we can determine, hey, um, if there's bad dye and those bad dye attributed to manufacturing defects, right? Um, which is where good dye and a bad dye neighborhood come into play. It could be a scratch. It could be a whole a uh, radic related issue that's causing you know uh, cluster bad cluster defects but those would be quality rules that get applied when we actually test the material over here now the key thing over here is that's because now i have access to design data i have access to my process data i can predict my yield i can predict based on process data hey this area of the wafer is going to be a bad wafer or hey i can predict that hey I'm going to have some dye that's going to get killed because of defect data. And then I can feed into how I actually do my assembly, right? I can say, hey, these are the rules I want you to apply to outlier and quality control, like looking for a good dye in a bad dye neighborhood or, you know, killing a whole section of the actual wafer because I had major process defect issues over here. That is, again, kind of like the closed loop, right? I'm taking design data, process data, and feeding into a recipe for how I want to assemble and test that material. But the other part of the closed loop is once I've actually seen the results, I can then feed those results back to the process guys or even to design guys and say, you know what, this is what we're actually seeing in real life. Can you make some process changes? Can you maybe, maybe make some design changes as well? As we get into the world of heterogeneous integration, you may have chiplets that were developed at 45 nanometers, other ones that were developed at seven nanometers or three nanometers. Does that change how this all goes together? Does it become harder to test and figure out what's going on and decipher all the data? Yes and no. Uh, it really depends how companies uh, release their TDKs and PDKs. Right. Traditionally, as you go from one technology node to another technology node, there's an element of reuse. You're basically shrinking the geometry. And this goes back to the traceability to say, hey, this chiplet over here, you know, it's a derivative of a chiplet that was built on a previous technology node. We had geometries change. We have made process of design changes. But that's where product lifecycle management comes into play at, right? Um, that data traditionally is stored in PLM tools. Um, and we can always tap back and say, you know what, hey, you can go back to a previous node, look at the actual data from there, see how that basically complements, and this goes back to commonality and correlation, over here to say, hey, now that we have a new node, different node that produced that chiplet, let's compare to the previous generation, the previous generation, either through chiplet families or product families or IP families, right? That's how we can connect the dots over there. And this is the long path toward really good characterization of all the things that go into the design, right? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to be able to look at data, trust data, trust data in the sense that, hey, you know, we haven't talked about that yet, but lot numbers change, device names change, right? From what the started off as being device A, suddenly ends up being device A prime or, you know, A dash B. Well, what caused that A dash B? Hey, there was a process issue or a test issue where I downgraded the actual product. And, and having that ability to see data from left to right and right to left is really and going to enable companies to cut down on test times, uh, you know, have first article success, you know, not have to go through two or three derivatives of a design. That's the goal with this basic diagram that we're showing over here. Was all this possible without AI in the past? Uh, it was not possible without AI. Possible, but it would have taken engineers 
months, I would say, uh, quarters, right? And in those quarters or months, you're basically losing yield, right? Now with the advent of AI, you know, we're able to go off and mine the data much faster. Secondly, even if those relationships are very, very loose, right? The gray areas where, hey, the lot numbers don't exactly match, the product names don't match, the IP block, somebody called it alpha, somebody called it alpha dash C. That's where you can go off and use AI and ML and train the models. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack, right? Traditionally, engineers were trained to go off and look at process data. Engineers were trained to go off and look at assembly and test data. And sometimes you would find somebody who understood process data and assembly and test data. Now with the advent of AI and ML, you can throw as much data as you want. You train the models, you know, and then it would go off and look for those other nuances or patterns that you may not have even dreamt about. And you found out something which is really interesting, which is that all this data is great because you could use it, but you also have to be able to access it in the future too. So it has to be organized in a way that you can make sense of it, right? That's a problem that we've tracked, Ed. Uh, we basically take all of this data, process data, design data, assembly and test data, all the way to you know production system board data, even collecting data from field deployed assets. And we load that into a universal data warehouse that Eurox has designed. Uh, and that data can be accessible for 12, 15, 25, 75 years. It just depends on how much the space you want to throw at the hardware. And that allows companies to go up and do commonality and correlation analysis, not just from a single fab. Imagine you're a large fabless uh, customer or you're, you know, you're an IDM and you have, let's say, five fabs, and your products are being built in those five fabs. You're sharing the same technology nodes, you're sharing the same IP. So now, uh, you know, what we're opening up is a total different realm where I'm not just looking at one fab's data or one, one device's data. I can go back and look across my data from different fabs, from different nodes, from different partners, and say, hey, uh, yeah, yeah, this is not a unique problem that I'm trying to solve over here in fab A. I see some similar patterns in fab B and C and D, even though those engineers may not have picked up on the problem and it may not be causing them low yield issues, but it may be causing them quality issues where the actual units may fail in the field. And now but by me looking at not just my data, but across fabs, across foundries, across products, across business units even, I can now find um, problems that I've never been able to find before. And one of the things that you're solving here is that you're getting rid of a lot of the finger pointing based upon maybe tightening tolerances and putting things together that never have been put together before where people say, okay, this is not just a one vendor solution. It's now a lot of pieces and here's where the problem is. We can identify exactly where pinpointed. I mean, the people have to trust the data. They trust the analysis. I mean, now this is all open, so we can say, you know, hey, this is how the correlation and commonality analysis models were built, right? These are the variables that we are providing. These are the tweaks uh, that you can make to the actual models, right? These are your degrees of freedom. And, and like I said, it's open. So when we go off and run this analysis and we show the actual results, it no longer becomes a finger pointing exercise, like you said. It's like, yeah, okay, I agree that this is the analysis. This is where it's hinting at the problem is now you can go up and do your own deep dive analysis and then come back and say, yeah, positive, I agree, this is my problem. Or, hey, model was wrong, analysis is wrong. It actually belongs somewhere else. It becomes a collaboration point. Whereas before, it would just be closed doors. Like, yeah, it's not my problem, go away. After Kar Aslam, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome, Ed. Thank you.